ay Welcome to Speak Sex. I am your host, Eve Eurydice. I am a Greek writer and artist from the island of Lesbos. Um, my uh, guest today is my fellow writer and sister and a woman I admire for so many reasons, Poroshista Kapoor. Um, welcome to the Thank show. Thank you so much for having me. It's such an honor. Mm-hmm. Well, I love your work and, you know, I love, I your love work. you too. <laughs> I love you too. <laughs> <laughs> love fast. <laughs> Poroshista Kapoor is the author of three critically acclaimed books, most recently Sick. That's Harper Collins, uh, which uh, has been praised as an eloquent and unflinchingly honest book about a woman's relationship to illness um, and also a reflection on personal and human frailty and the human condition. It's an intimate memoir about living within a body that does not feel at ease. Um, it's gotten great reviews. It has been selling very well. Her first novel was Sons and Other Flammable Objects, which is how I get to know her work. Her second book was The Last Illusion, um, was best book of the year in 2014. Um, and Porushista is uh, a Persian who lives in America. So she's a fellow global writer. Right. Right. Because we write in English because it's the Latin of the modern world, but you were born in Tehran. Yes. And you went to L.A. How old? Well, by the time I got to L.A., I was at, you know, preschool, kindergarten age, oh. but because it took us a while to leave Iran. And then we traveled via Turkey throughout Europe. And then eventually, you know, the refugee story went so that we, we got to the East Coast. And then, like, almost all Iranians decided to go to the, West to the L.A. Coast. area. Yeah. 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 So, so that's why you don't have an accent. <laughs> no, I learned on the playground to cultivate a valley girl accent. Ah, that was very intentional better. because I, I had an accent. I remember that in, when I was first put in ESL, I had an accent, but I was obsessed with pop culture. I was obsessed with MTV and like TV mm. shows. Mm. And, you know, this was LA in the 80s. And so, you know... I very much intentionally remember trying to cultivate a Valley Girl accent. Now I want to get rid of it all the time. <laughs> I, wish, <laughs> I wish New York had rid me of my Valley Girl you accent. You de it, it, it didn't do it. It still comes out. So I don't know. I don't know. Every, depends on where I am. Right now I'm in Miami. So like, oh yeah, you don't know. Yeah, everybody has an accent. So yeah. You, but no one can which, hear each other's accents anymore. Right. But I don't know if I should be New York or LA or what. But it, it, it's, it's always funny to me when I'm in, you know, place cities other than those two cities that I predominantly lived in, because it's always like you code switch to some degree depending mm-hmm. on where you are. And I don't know the codes here, so it's like I don't even know how to speak here. <laughs> but I love the way everyone speaks. And I love the way you speak. So I kind of wish I had my accent. You sound to me like an intellectual valley girl. I would, you know, I would. <laughs> And you may be the uh, only one. <laughs> the, the intellectual valley girl, I'll take yeah. it. Yeah, that's funny. Yeah, I have always hated my English because, you know, um, for those who are not multilingual, we don't think with an accent. <laughs> right. So when I don't write with an accent, right. um, and then when I open my mouth to give a reading, I am like, there's a major disconnect. I'm like, why do these words sound like that? Like, that's yeah. not what I intended. It sounds so foreign to me. Do you think uh, in Greek at mostly, or do you no, dream in uh, Greek? When I, I, well, when I'm in Greece, I think and dream in Greek. Uh, wow. But here, I think and dream in English. Right. Um, but English was my third, fourth language. So I, wow. I've got my full baccalaureate before I ever even started English wow. and then I was learning Spanish and those Romance languages, I didn't have an accent because wow, it's the same right. pronunciation. Of course. So, and of course, this was in, in the town of Iraklion in Crete. So the Cretan lady <laughs> teaching me English did not know I have an accent because she had an accent. Oh, she spoke funny. English like a Cretan. Oh my God, that's amazing. <laughs> British English like wow. a Cretan. <laughs> wow. 
That's so hilarious. with that language, I like arrived in LA <laughs> when I was 15. <laughs> Oh my God. That's amazing. <laughs> and I mean, I was, you know, in, let's say intelligent enough where at the age of 15, I was put in honors English as a senior, but I didn't know what these kids were talking about. It would be like, you're so off the wall. And I would like, look at the wall. You know, I didn't <laughs> know. <laughs> Love that. So I it's interesting, it. you know, that I think as a foreigner, you look at the culture differently more objectively but also the language which yeah. is our main topic of interest and you know of course thought yeah. the language yeah so you don't take it for granted and you don't um abide by its given rules you know as eagerly as the natives i was just telling students today about how a lot of um people writers who speak english like call, got, get called language writers mm. but it's funny i mean it's like I have mixed emotions on that, but I also think a lot of us become stylists. You know, it's not a right. coincidence that Nabokov was a stylist and the best. And that, yeah, and that <laughs> you know, you certainly are, and and I think I, you mm -hmm. know, instead of like, like a, I don't know what's the opposite of that, a sort of badly trained speed skater who's just kind of <laughs> plunking along, you know, or a snowboarder. Mm -hmm. But that's my mm -hmm. thing. I think, you know, we have that love of like the English language because mm -hmm. we can see it outside of ourselves. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I think that's really, really, really special. And I, I almost can always tell when I read a book by a writer who doesn't have English as their first language because mm -hmm. the appreciation of the language and what they do with it is mm -hmm. so magical. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, I very often pick up uh, the foreignness in my work after, you know, in like maybe a fourth or tenth read. Yeah. But I leave it there because I think it enriches it because it, it echoes my own ancient tongue and, you know, my, my linguistic journey. Yes. And it also kind of absolves Engli English from its transactionalism, which is its main use, you yeah. know, worldwide. <laughs> totally. So I think it can profit from that more lyrical, yeah. you know, oddity. I often tell editors, they sometimes want to edit me because I'll have inversions that are almost like Yoda Yeah, speak. the inversions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, they'll be <laughs> like, you mean, you know, this clause needs to go before this clause. And I'm like, no, actually, I want it to be a little bit irregular because mm -hmm. that's how mm -hmm. it sounds in my head and must be how, um, you know, and usually is has to do something with Farsi. And mm. I need it to sound like that. I know how to write a basic sentence. I yeah. know how to normalize <laughs> yeah. for English speakers. I was a journalist too. I mean, uh -huh. I, I know how to write a straightforward sentence, but I don't want my prose yeah. to be straightforward. There's a reason there's certain twists and turns uh -huh. that I want to take in uh -huh. my language. And so I have to fight editors on that a lot. Have you had to fight editors with that? Yeah. Yeah. And um, I mean, my feeling is that you cannot get people, readers, to stop and think unless you give them something unfamiliar. Yeah. So if you in any way allow them to go where they've already been, they'll yeah. stick to what they know and they'll just like not even pay attention to what you're saying and they will, you know, have a goal in mind. Like, yeah. what's the story? How does this end? Yeah. You know, what does it tell us about all of us? And it's like, no, yeah. I, it's not about all of us. It's about right. you. Exactly. Yeah, you have to waken the reader, Is right? That right? Did I say waken? Right? Awaken, so now I'm becoming yeah. yourself. You you have to you have to do that, and you have to shake them out of um, the sort of basic r rules of I don't know. Grammar to me just seems like so one hundred and one. Mm -hmm. It's it's kind of ridiculous, mm -hmm. you know. And I know the copy editors. I love them, bless them, all that, but. I, I think a light hand is always important when you're talking about, to prose stylists. And I think a lot of what's missing in contemporary literature is a little bit of experiment in language. It's almost like writers want, are, their egos are so fragile that they're afraid they're going to think that. And I yeah. don't think we have that insecurity. And we were talking about no, this no, the other don't. day. Like you and I no. are not particularly insecure people. Right. And, yeah. and I yeah. think that is... Um, yeah. Well, I think that, um, I mean, 
two things. One is, yes, you have to master the grammar before you can sabotage it. You got to right. learn something before you can take it apart, right. whether it's like an engine or whether it's a watch or whether it's, a, you know, yeah. the components of a language. Right. So, yeah. Um, I loved my strunk and white when I was strunk and white. <laughs> oh, I still school. have it. I still have it on my <laughs> near my desk, very close, within arm's reach. Yeah. But and and it's not to so much follow it, but yeah. to be aware of what you're undoing. You exactly. Know? It's like art school. When I went to art school in Europe, we had to go to the museum every day and copy all the statues, oh, and wow. there was no skipping it. You know, Amazing. we had to do the sculptures, we had to do the paintings, we had to do the Renaissance paintings, copy, 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 copy for like two years. Wow. I came here and it's like they didn't want to copy anything. They just right. said, so just express yourself, you know, just be you. And but, but, but we weren't taught the basics. Right. So that's the difference, you know, like deconstruction is great, but you got to go through the construction first. Yeah, definitely. So you earn it. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, but I do feel that as women, we owe it to, you know, our fellow women to smash the patriarchy and tear things up. Um, so I, I do think that we have a double responsibility. Like yeah. if male writers are doing it for um, some sort of like inner rebellion against the dominant culture, yeah. we owe it to our sisters, you know, and our ancestors and our daughters who have or have not yet been born to take apart the logos and find in it some sort of space for us because we're excluded. Yeah, absolutely. And, and yet we're the creators. We're the creators. <laughs> and like, you know, open it up, like stretch it open, you know, all these meanings that are, only reinforcing our oppression. Yeah. You know, all the definitions, all the laws, everything that makes up this language is designed to keep us in our place. Absolutely, yeah. So we do have to, you know, fuck the language up. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I think so. Yeah. I think so. I mean, I, I, it, it took me a lot of years, I think, to realize, like, I mean, what women had... A, to understand that, that why some of my favorite writers were women experimental writers and why and, and their role and, and the tragedy of so many of them being underappreciated or underrecognized. Mm -hmm. But, you know, mm -hmm. that's the lineage that I feel like I aspire to belong in. I hope I belong in in some way. Or, or But, you know, I read their bios and it's like the same shit, the same shit that we see today. I was just talking to my students today about Leonora Carrington. And the horrors that she went through with, you know, the Surrealist and Max Ernst and then being committed to mental asylums constantly. And, you know, the drugs they gave them back then, oh, yeah. I mean, those were like first generation, like yeah. God knows what antipsychotics or who knows. I mm -hmm. mean, the, she was literally fed poison for years and told she was insane. And she had to go to Mexico City to finally mm -hmm. come into her own. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a journey. And, and but you see, she was insane. That's the system, you know. When we become, when we women become like fake men yeah. and buy into all the laws and we want to like dress like them, talk like them, you know, earn the perks and the money within the system, we forget that the actual woman is the crazy woman in the attic. Mm -hmm. We have been defined as insane. Yeah. And we have to like cut ourselves off completely from our truth, yeah. both our body truth yeah. and our, you know, spiritual consciousness, yeah. ancient memory, DNA truth, in order to fit in and be like logical and sane and yeah. play by the rules. Yeah, totally. I mean, that's, it's, it's such, uh, I, I think you have to be older too. I, I don't see it's so easy for young women. I mean, I remember a whole chunk of my life where I was like the girl that hung around with the boys. And I, I think yeah. even at that point, when I was first re reading Leonora, Leonora Carrington, I re misunderstood what was happening to her as she hung around with the boy surrealists, you know, and I used to think those photos of 
Max Ernst forcibly kissing her, you know, were sexy in a way. Right. Um, but now I see it really differently. And I see it as like, why did she endure all that? Why did it take such a big part of her early life. She went through such torture and she was so talented as a visual artist and a writer, but she was so screwed by that. Um, and then, you know, you, there's just so many examples of women that were, you know, had to literally tear themselves out of that, those um, paradigms. But mm -hmm. I see women today, like contemporaries mm -hmm. of ours, mm -hmm. who are literally trapped mm -hmm. in the same way. And I wonder what would happen to their prose, not right. just their prose, but what would happen to their like essence, you know, mm. if they were um, torn away from it. And, you know, as a single woman, there are times that I wonder like, oh, did I pick the right path? Is this the wrong, wrong path? You know, do I need a partner? Do I need a male partner? But um, I, I don't know if I could have created what, I, mm -hmm. what I've created so far. Well, you know, I think that Seeking the approval of a man of authority um, is something that you cannot do unconsciously. You just, you know, cannot allow yourself to yeah. do it without thinking because yeah. it will destroy you. Yeah. Um, and a, a lot of us, when we're young, we side with the manpower because that's the only power there is. And we <laughs> right. know that, like, the alternative is becoming our mothers and being nothing and a nobody and invisible and yeah. just, like, a maid or, yeah. you know, something... <laughs> Serving our dad. Serving like, the yeah. man. Yeah. So, you know, early on, that's all you see. Either you become the man or you become the servant to the man. Yeah, well said, yeah. Um, true. But then slowly, you know, within like the limited tools that were afforded by the system, which is the male language, the male thought, the male philosophy, all that stuff, we realized that, wait a second, just like they created all of these that we're using, we can create our own. Yeah, And we had, perhaps, uh, I mean, it, it's not in written history, but hey, written history is very short. <laughs> right, that's true. <laughs> right? right. Um, I do think that our, our moment is coming. That's what I was going to ask you. Do you think we're, like, the question I constantly have when I'm trying to like talk to younger women or, or students is like, are we there yet or are we arriving at it? And a part of me is always an optimist and wants to say we're, we're either like getting there or we're there, but I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't see how we are there yet, but we have to, we've got to be close, but yeah. the, the impediments, this last gasp of the patriarchy, if it indeed oh. is the last gasp, is I think like really, really, really killing a lot of us. I mean, it is a struggle. It's taking a lot out of our bodies and our minds and, Mm -hmm. And all that. So mm -hmm. it's like, I've seen a lot of women suffer in the last few years, but I can't help but think like there's another, it's, you know, we're going to get over this hump. Yeah. I hope, I hope so too. For, for sure, right now, sexism is prevailing. Right. Like just the pigs are in charge. Yeah. Um, and we are lucky that we're here and not, you know, in countries well, our, our own countries, our native countries yeah, are even true. more repressed. But, right. you know, we came here thinking, when I first came here, I thought, oh, wow, like, feminism is, like, really, you know, it has taken off. It's unstoppable. You know, yeah. I mean, I, I identified as post-feminist. Yeah, right. <laughs> What's the hubris of that? You know, I was yeah. like, oh, no, you know, that all has been earned, and I'm a post-feminist, and then, you know, it turned around, and... Even feminism, like that second wave, had been forgotten. Yeah. You know? So yeah, we get co-opted so easily. Yeah. In the nineties, I thought it was like fine, like everything was yeah. okay. Yeah. Me too. And me like, too. We were all like know, post like, post feminist punks. Yeah. And totally. It's like what? What? <laughs> and it's like I don't know if it's like nine eleven that happened that moved everyone behind or what or just two thousands culture, you know. Uh, but I, I mean, it couldn't have just been nine eleven. The, the, I, I think I was a music journalist back then. It's like culture and the music that came out right after, you know, uh, grunge and Riot Girl was so that sort of boy band and you know that sort of sugary pop that you saw with so many of these young, you know, ex Mouseketeer like mm -hmm. singers. It was it's so conservative that the mm -hmm. the sexuality was oh, so basic, so you know, and it was yeah. like such a change where it's like 
just mm-hmm. the years, like literally two years before in music history, like, you know, you had groups like, you know, Bikini Kill and L7 and and Hole and all these women that were mm-hmm. like to- PJ Harvey, like people that that dominated the charts acting completely like beating men mm-hmm. at their punk rockness by far. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then there was like no talk. Nothing. It all it. ended. It's like yeah. it, it was like suddenly it was disappeared. It all, I know. And I, I think it, it, it began with AIDS because mm. the fear of like sex, the new fear of sex, oh, yeah. right? Uh, right? Put the dump on our sexual revolution. Yeah. And then with nine, and then it was the, the election, well, a little bit, the whole um, Monica Lewinsky moment right. was very strange for us because yeah. we wanted to say that like free sex, but it was clear that that was wrong, but that was our people. So it was just like a major reckoning and Anita Hill, we lost that battle, Monica yes. Lewinsky, we didn't even know where we were in the battle, but we lost it. Yeah, totally. And then of course that election of 2000, you know, the whole thing of like the millennium is coming, the millennium brought us the stolen election. Right, exactly. Which was like a coup. Yeah. We, we lived through it in Florida very much, like my vote was not counted oh uh, with God, the chads right. then. Yeah. And then 9-11, right after, right after. And so, you know, it just seemed that the world was shifting and we haven't gotten our bearings since, but the Christians and evangelicals and the white supremacists, they have been very comfortable. Yeah, that's true. Because they got like Bush, what, twice? Barack was just not a rebel. Yeah, everyone (laughs) wanted him to be. We all wanted him to be. Be, uh, but he know, never said more he decisive. was right. No. He was always a moderate, and he was always. Mm-hmm. Right. But everyone was mm-hmm. so eager to have our first black president be like a Black Panther. Yeah, and he, that he never said he was, and so uh, you know, and and we always knew that he was going to be a consensus not, guy, right? And not great consensus on foreign policy with the enemy, right? I mean, he wasn't a great friend to the Middle East, certainly, Mm-mm. and he was not at all, and not to journalists either, no, and not to journalists. Whistleblowers got it worse than ever. I, I know, mean, it's horrifying. a lot. You know, immigration oh. tough on Im- immigration. I know people don't realize that. Yeah, and, and then this you know, atrocity now, <laughs> and then this where it's beyond. <laughs> Speaking of language, I mean, forget the weird, like saying you know the language is male. Okay, but this is like prelingual. This is masculinity that's prelingual. <laughs> totally. It's prelingual. It's like, I'm absolutely right. It's, it's just like, like kindergarten playground machismo <laughs> in charge. Literally, like, just <laughs> grab him by the pussy. What was that? Right. I don't even remember. Yeah. It was so yeah. stupid. It was like, I just yeah. can't even believe it. It's only literate stuff. Yeah. So I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. You How do you fight that? that? Doesn't read, that doesn't care about reading, that doesn't, you know. Yeah, that it's, it's he's proud to be like a brute. Yeah, and mm-hmm. then you have like a whole portion of the nation that thinks that's fabulous. Yeah, they think and that's it's like. It's yeah, cr- it's just crazy. I mean, it's 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 it would be like for a writer, it would be like almost comical and laughable if we didn't have to live in it. Mm-hmm. You know. Well, they think that he is actually. A rebel. He is like you know. He's like a reactionary. So all of a sudden, we okay, not we as women, but like we as like language people and so on and so forth yeah. have become the patriarchy. They yeah. they shifted everything in such a convenient little way that we are the status quo and they are <laughs> the revolutionaries. You know, right. and like we are the uh, PC tyranny. <laughs> I mean, I wait, know. since when? Like since three days ago? <laughs> I know. It's Have so we nuts. forgotten history? Centuries? <laughs> what what time frames are we working with? Right? Exactly. It's so bizarre. I mean, the idea, this, I think part of it is like, again, we're t- talking about like being experimental writers or like, or like out of a norm. But Donald Trump has sold this idea that he is part of this like iconoclastic Right. maverick America, right. this myth, right, yeah. of the American yeah. who doesn't fit in, and yet everything he believes in from his, like, right. weird KFC, like, dinner to, like, boasting about <laughs> McDonald's to, like, the, his wife to, like, mm-hmm. every single thing about him is, like, as 
basic and normal and conventional mm-hmm. as every aspect of the, the American dream is, you know? Mm-hmm. I don't know where this idea of the American maverick iconoclast, I mean, it's almost like Americans think that it's a, it's a Cormac McCarthy novel and that, that America was full of these like weird renegades who went through the night, you know, and, and, and did all this like, you know, weird, um, subversive esoteric like activity but I, I i truly don't understand it i i i mean if they're talking about the puritans uh that's one thing but it's to me that that rebellion is not a, a real rebellion no because it, it loves corporations period yeah. <laughs> <laughs> loves them loves yeah. brands and all yeah that. profit that's yeah. what they love it's you know crazy. so it's just all in 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 the end on behalf of the dollar. It's not on behalf of like individual freedom or That's the, thing, the rights of even like white dudes. It's not right. even about them. Mm-mm. Yeah, money is God here. And that's mm-hmm. the thing that is, you know, whether you believe in God or not, I think everyone can agree that this is a problem in America is that like instead of the same way, you know, in certain countries you'll have uh, religious fundamentalism. Here our religious fundamentalism is capitalism. Yeah. So that is... Is, I agree with that completely. Is, is, a, is an illness. It is. It's it the, is the fundamental illness yeah, of, a, it, of the country. It's one of the yeah. most diseased forms of religious fundamentalism. Yeah. And people say these other religious fundamentalist countries, well, they cause deaths in the name of God. Well, we cause deaths all the time in the name in of the money. Name of, of profit. I mean, profit, that's how slavery right. happened, exactly. which is the ultimate sin of America. Yeah. And, you know, the religions of America, evangelism, all of that, right. are all about money. And they buy faith, they, you know, the same way that so many Americans buy love, you know, it's just like materialism will make you happy. It doesn't, but that's the gospel that we spread around the world. And we, you know, when you have uh, people who are vulnerable because their cultures have recently fallen apart or, you know, imploded, like the Soviet Union or China, you know, vast cultures that have imploded, um, but are ancient, in fact, yeah. you know, uh, even India, they're very vulnerable to this message. Yeah, totally. Of like, m- you know, material bliss. But that's the funny thing is that goes back to what we we're saying about like reading and writing. It's like mm-hmm. if, you've, if you're a well-read person, even like you don't even have to be that well-read. Every cautionary tale and every culture says those who go yeah. chasing that pot of gold, the story doesn't end well. Mm-hmm. And that doesn't mean you have to like be a starving artist either, as we were saying no. today. Like that's not especially a not a woman starving artist. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> like, <Damn. laughs> we are owed like our, yeah. you know yeah. a lot of money as just women existing in this society. But the point is like ch- that pursuit in itself of just chasing money is a cursed pursuit. And that's been the American game, like for so right. so long. Mm-hmm. I mean, mm-hmm. and and it's an empty game. There's no, exactly. there's no, nothing beyond yeah. it. You know, you you have your stacks of cash, your Scrooge McDucks swimming in your in your uh, you know pool of dollar bills, and and what's next? You know, you just accumulate stuff. Yeah. Where does it go? And yeah. you have all these entrepreneurs, right, who then set up nonprofits for tax write-offs and stuff like that. I mean, even that system to me is like so laughable um, mm-hmm. because philanthropy is like again and a euphemism. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's still tied to profit. Honestly, yeah, it's yeah. a lot paying taxes yeah. so that you know the people don't have money for like infrastructure and teachers right. and healthcare and right. the basics. And you pretend that, you know, you're taking that money and doing some good. Come on. That's so bad. Gross. And it's, it's also all ego driven. It's totally. all like power hungry, you know, yeah. like let me have all the centralized power over as many people as possible. Just like, gross. I don't know. I know it is. It's, it's very really like, unbecoming. Yeah. <laughs> and karmically speaking, it's just like, you know, I think detrimental, devastating for right. the person doing it. I think we understand because we came from ancient empires that fell right. and had oh, to yeah. learn their own lessons. Oh, of, yeah. of, you know, um, but you know, and that's the thing. This empire has been teetering mm-hmm. on collapse for a while. Mm-hmm. Um, it's certainly it's nothing. I mean, it, it it doesn't have the 
I can't compare to our empires, so I'm biased, but I, I feel like <laughs> I'm biased our, too, I agree. our level of innovation and invention yes. and, yeah. and our arts and culture, I mean, mm-hmm. this, all this country does is borrow from that without mm-hmm. knowing it. Um, but um, yeah, this, this empire can't survive, uh, nor should it, if its entire um, currency is currency. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Like, that's it's just like the bank of the world. That's what yeah. it is. It's a banker. That's what New York City now looks like, by the mm-hmm. way. I miss New York all the time, but when I go back there, everything is just banks. Yeah. Same you know? with London. Oh. Just you know, it's all they are. It's so wild to walk through downtown New York mm-hmm. and you have drugstores and banks. Mm-hmm. And they're often like the drugstores are sometimes in the old banks and there's ten million other banks. <laughs> <laughs> it's a weird, eerie um mm-hmm. Eerie thing. It's you know. definitely post. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, it's it's uh, this is not 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 healthy. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I feel that that's um, our opening for the natural religion, for you know the return to like the feminine powers, for um, ritualizing behavior, you know, for kind of destabilizing property laws, inheritance laws. Yeah. Um, I mean, anything, I, f- I, believe, you know, I feel that as women, we should try to destabilize as much as we can because it's all stacked against us, right? Right. I mean, you and I have the name of our fathers by which we're recognized. And yeah. then, you know, our daughters, if we have them, are supposed to have the name of, of their of their still to, to a certain degree passed from one man to another as right. their own. Yeah. And... The inheritance laws are the same, you know. I mean, a couple of like the 20, 30 years ago, m- women couldn't have their own checking accounts without a man signing on to it. So these, the few things, the few rights that we have gained are very recent. Right. And we just got to remember that and not take anything for granted and keep pushing for more. Yeah. Um, and it, it, I think it's important to stop using the money we have or make to make ourselves desirable objects yeah. that men will want yeah. and instead make ourselves more powerful. Yeah, we have to redefine know, that. Wiser and, you know, bring in our sisters and try to kind of like discover our strength in numbers in whatever our area and our part in the world, you know, in the culture is. Having that consciousness and, you know, kind of like, trying to put women first exactly it's been really really disheartening to see women tear each other down at times in Mm -hmm. the last couple years and Mm -hmm. it's like that's exactly what patriarchy wants Mm -hmm. exactly what it needs Mm -hmm. um is to create those divides but at the Mm -hmm. same time on the flip side there's been a lot of women coming together um i hope that they're not only coming together through like misfortune that's one mm-hmm. of the things that sometimes I thought about with like the Me Too movement, which was, you know, potent and important in its own way. But I thought like this can't be the only thing that brings us together is our tragedies. You know, I remember in Riot Girl days, like one of the things that women would often bond on was like how much we'd been raped. And I remember feeling that connection to other women who'd also been raped. Mm-hmm. And it was like, okay, we've been through this horror together and like we get it. But I, I, the, the future I envision that I hope for is like a time where we can come together in a complete empowerment and joy and we control that. And we, you know, it's like we can walk by rows of fuming, angry, red in the face men who just can't even like keep up with us. And we're walking in light, you mm. know, and just like that. That's what I want to see. Cause I think, I mean, it's been for my body at least. The last few years, it's just torn me down. It's been really, really hard. I, I don't think it's uh, my illnesses are, are 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 unrelated. I mean, in some ways, but in some ways, they're they're not. They are very related to this political climate. I mean, stress has been unreal for me the last few years. And a lot of that has had to do with activism or um, fighting for other women or fighting for myself or all that. And and it's taken a lot. Um, out of us. So, mm-hmm. how do we preserve ourselves so we can continue doing this? You know. Well, I definitely feel that your body, um, 
and what has happened to you personally is because it's a female body. I don't think that if you were a boy, man, (laughs) you would have gone through it all. I just don't, you know, so I think it's a particular openness and, and, you know, yeah, openness that comes part and parcel with being a woman. I totally understand. Yeah, that makes like, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, I like I said, so many of my friends right now who've had, got had physical trials the last years have been women. Mm-hmm. You mm-hmm. know, and it's like they're strong as hell. If it did happen to men, they wouldn't have survived it, I think. But we survived it. But, you know, like, it's just like I just wish I'm so torn on on how self-care works, really. You know, I loved... I love still the work of Audrey Lord, and she's mm. been very important to me. Um, and yeah. what she means when she talks about self care, I think it's different than how it's become commodified, of course. But like, um, how do we take care of ourselves and still stay afloat in this environment? I mean, some, I used to get very angry when people would say like, "You should rest more." I'd say that's that's that's, that's there's something like subversive about that. What are they going to do while we sleep? You know, that's actually like very yeah. ancient culture shit. I feel that, that hypervigilance, too. Yeah. right? Yeah, of yeah, like, I have that too. like, what are they going to do while we, we, do mm-hmm. they need us to like not produce or something or just mm-hmm. hide while they go and burn the villages down or what, you know, it's like, well, always like the bed rest, which is, you know, was very often, very commonly, um, the, the treatment for women yeah. was you know, disempowering them. Right. You just, uh, you know, go to bed, Mm -hmm. take a year off, you know, stay nine months in bed while you're pregnant or whatever. It's always like bed rest out of the, out of the circulation. Right. Um, I agree with you. I think that, you know, in the 50s and 60s, we were all given the volume, you know, I mean, before that, like bloodletting, I mean, leeching, whatever. (laughs) It's just taking the life away from us. Yeah. Um, The, you know, disempowering, Constant controlling the, woman, the right. women's bodies, and like mm-hmm. you know, and at the same time, I know, like I, I'm an example of someone who probably should have rested more, but we have to rest on our own terms and yeah. like own that idea, right? Yeah. Like that's like really tricky because the pace of the world is completely crazy. I, this it has to be last gasp of patriarchy because there's a panic in the. Pace. There is a panic, and there is also such an anxiety. So much oh, anxiety, yeah. and it's like. We, I think a lot of us as women, I certainly internalize the anxiety of others. I have to learn to not do this. I mean, I've worked on this with so much, so, so many therapists and healers. It's like surround yourself, like, like protect yourself. Don't take on the horrible energy, especially of these men who are panicking all around us. A lot of these white males who are losing their minds all around us. Um, and protect yourself and again be around women who like yeah. and don't just be around women who've had easy lives right be around know? women uh, women who are know, kicking ass exactly with major badass challenges. women yeah. and be around nature oh yeah because you know, nature. nature is female it's true it's yeah. true the only time i feel well is when i'm around nature yeah me actually. too I feel so much better when I'm in nature because everything too. is in its proper place. You know, yeah. I, I just don't feel that imbalance. You know, exactly. there's too much phallic bullshit all around. And do, you think, <laughs> do you think technology is masculine? Energy? Yes. Yeah. I think, so too. I think technology is so controlling. I like, do too. Yeah. So, Purushista, um, I haven't spent, how long did it take you to write sick? Um, sick, actually, the first draft of it, um, in a way took like years. It came from like, it was a messy thing. It was like emails and, um, bits of letters to people that I just had sort of compiled and like bits of Facebook posts. And I thought it was going to be a much more experimental book. And it was like this like weird sprawling monster. And then after I sold it, and then I, I tried various attempts at different drafts. I totally wrote a different book. Mm. I, I, it, and it took, I wrote it all post concussion, which was crazy. I threw away what I had from before and I wrote it in months, really. Wow. I mean, I wrote it in like under a year, certainly. And it was like, 
feverish. I mean, my concu- it was part of my concussion treatment. I wasn't supposed to look at computer screens, but I was also like, fuck that. I don't want to not look at a computer screen. I want to re- regain my uh, mental strength. So I sort of went against doctor's orders. And I wrote it really fast, but I also wrote it simply the way someone with a concussion would write. And then I felt, oh my God, what am I doing? That's not good. That's not like my previous work as a as a stylist or someone who writes complexly. And um, and then I thought to myself, well, writing it simply might be the right thing for my audience, actually. I mean, I wanted other sick people to be able to read it the way that I had written it, which was, you know, in the manner of a simple, thin book. I mean, people still say it's complicated and spiraling and it has um, some multi-layered narratives, but certainly less complicated than my other work. And I wanted it to be kind of like a page turner that you read in like a few hours. Mm. And that's the reports I got from a lot of mm. readers, which my other books were not yeah. um, page turners. I page turner kind of sounds like an insult, but... <laughs> you know, for us, like for but us, like, for like for the general population, yeah. it's a great compliment. Right. I mean, I, I just I, I liked it for this book only because this mm-hmm. is like for me, this book doesn't really count to me. Like like mm-hmm. every time someone says, Should I buy one of your books? I, I always refer them to my first two books. Your first books, yeah. Yeah, but because this wasn't like a book I chose to write. This yeah. is a book I did as service. That's what my sex book that I'm working on, I feel, I mean, I don't know that it'll be a page turner, but in a sense, that's what I think, that it's yeah. nothing to do with my work per se, but yeah. it's a service, you know, to like my sisters mostly yeah. and to my moment in history. And it's something that I know so much about. Right. So you want to share it yeah, and you want to share it in a way that's intelligible to as many people as possible, right. you know, exactly. so you can be of use. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's what probably happened that you learned a lot. I mean, I know you learned so much. You're kind of like a practitioner, a healer right now <laughs> by by default because you have so much knowledge. Way too much uh, that I did about not ask all for. kinds of alternative treatments. Um mm. and a lot of what you've been learning about are women's diseases, um yeah. you know, everything that's immune deficiency and oh, and yeah. everything that's not quite um, diagnosable is something that women get more than men. Absolutely. I mean, like so much of... Just the, the female body is not yeah. as familiar to Western medicine as the male body, which exactly. is the standard. Yeah, yeah. which is, I, I keep telling my many male doctors, that's why I can't do well on a lot of the medications they want to give me because these were medications that were tested on men. I know that. I mean, I, I do poorly on most Western meds. and um, And all my like diagnoses now are evolving into like semi autoimmunity and, and, you know, things like, like, you know, uterine fibroids or like, uh, cysts on my breasts or thyroid nodules. That's, you know, at first seemed cancerous and all these, like they're very specific ways that the Lyme and the biotoxin illness are manifesting that I do think of as sort of like, sadly, like, um, female in a way. I mean, yeah. even just like the issue of weight, I've lost a lot of weight mm-hmm. and that's been really something I've been thinking about a lot mm-hmm. I, in a really dark moment a few weeks ago. Because I, I go to doctors and I say, this is not my body. Mm-hmm. I'm too thin right now. And mm-hmm. they go, no, you look fine. You're fine. And I go, no, I, I am oh, yeah. Iranian. Like we have yeah. curves and I mm-hmm. miss my curves. And the, I was crying about a week or two ago with some friends of mine. I thought I I should just go to like a hospital and say I'm anorexic mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and then maybe they would actually like focus on what my I'm weight yeah. Right. Yeah. And, yeah. and realize that like it's really hard for mm-hmm. someone to get well who's mm-hmm. constantly eating and constantly losing weight mm-hmm. you know I'm not throwing it up I'm not you know it's it's, it's just not being absorbed right. properly but these doctors they they don't look at like you're saying like nature is feminine right nourishment yeah, Good nourishment is so important. Right. And I don't think it's an accident that as we women get a modicum of social power and visibility, we had to shrink more and more and more. Yeah. When we were just like pure objects and we were the damsels in distress and we were not good for nothing but like 
be in fact and then you know procreating yeah uh we could be like voluptuous and lie on the sofas you exactly. know and be objectified all they wanted right. and they could lose them themselves in our flesh yeah, yeah, yeah but you know all of a sudden we got like uh, you know not even it, it's not even equal rights or equal pay but like we got out in the marketplace after the second war especially and yeah. we got positions we hadn't been allowed in before and so we got a little bit more power right. and it's like start shrinking 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 so now the ideal woman is so thin that she there is no way that those extremely undernourished you know gorgeous models could get what it, an, an average woman gets done, which is like have a yeah. job, nine to five, have kids, raise kids, deal with a husband, you know, pay the bills. I mean, we, we right now, you know, equality has actually been translated into our doing the job of two or three people while we're supposed to be emaciating. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's, it's such a good point. I mean, it's really, really, really sad. I mean, that's always like the dark side of the 90s where I used to be like a 90s obsessive and I'd be like, those were the good old days. But then I think about like heroin chic and that was like when oh, I had like I know. gotten to New York and I was praised for like having the body of a little boy, you know, and partially yeah. that was just like yeah. Yeah. the aesthetic and partially that was just like me being too poor to eat. And, and like, <laughs> and no, like, it's the aesthetic and we fall victim to it. And you know, the way that it, I'm sorry to interrupt, but no. I, you know, I lived it for sure in the nineties in New York. And I was like, if I gain weight, that shows that like my mental power is diminished. Yeah. I mean, but that's how I, you know, I thought, Oh, yeah. you know, I'm in charge. You yeah. know, my body is like my slave. How sick is that? Like, I wasn't holistic in any way. It was just like my yeah. body had to be under my control and I rode it as hard as like a slave driver. I know. And it, it, I only felt empowered if, if I proved my, you know, like my mental, male mental control over my poor body yeah. by like not feeding it or whatever it took, you know, just yeah. using it as if I'm the man. Like I, so it's a split eye. So the eye was really all brain. Yeah. And the body was again like the objectified female that I could have my way with. Yeah, totally. It makes so I much know. sense. It's I so know. weird. Because we I internalized I that, that we did that maleness. God, I wish we I wish we could I you know, people say no regrets. I got a lot of regrets, but like I'm not tormented by my regrets, but I have regrets. And my part of that is like I wish those prime years i know i had lived differently me too and i had eaten nice food yeah, and i too. had not done every drug <laughs> and before that was again like competing with boys you know yeah. like being around the world of men who yeah. like just like you know all the drug dealers were males you know oh, yeah all, all that yeah. partying was run by these horrible boys all the you know rape culture that was so prevalent i mean you yeah, think know, about so grunge and all that. I mean, all it I was know. was this champion. And now I find it so embarrassing. It, it's so funny. It was like music that was so important to me. And now I find such a chunk of it to be so, so embarrassing um, because it's like these mediocre men who are whining about God knows what while they were raping women all mm -hmm. the time and like mm -hmm. relying on, you know, um, except, except Kurt Cobain. I, I make that, I was talking to a friend the other day and it's like, we were discussing this, and I think someone. I don't know. Well, if he was a written, Pisces. He was a Pisces. I <laughs> he love was a, a sensitive Pisces. boy. I know. Yeah, you guys are great. I, I mean, know. he he was a sensitive boy, and he was very much chronically ill. Yeah, and that's the thing that people Ill. forget about yeah. all the time. It's in a suicide yeah, note. I mean, so his much stomach pain. pains. His stomach. Who knows what? I mean, medicine wasn't advanced enough. Why did Kurt Cobain his whole life like? He Suffer. was in pain. I mean, that whole hunched look that we would always mm -hmm. imitate, the bad mm -hmm. posture that Kurt mm -hmm. Cobain had, mm -hmm. that same, those granny sweaters that yeah, he would yeah, wear yeah. in pajamas. <laughs> That's literally yeah. like what I'm wearing half the time. Like, those, <laughs> like you know, it's like, it's like what chronically yeah. ill people wear. You yeah. know, he'd, he'd show up on stage in bathrobes. I know, but I he mean, glamorized illness. <laughs> he did, but it was before we had the language to think we, about yeah. chronic illness. Oh, yeah. Yeah, we, we all, didn't even know we until. Didn't know. Well, I mean, we knew a little bit, but it was only when he died that it became clear how yeah. real it was. Exactly. Because no one was thinking a 27-year-old then yeah. could have like maybe an autoimmune disease or something exactly. like that. And these days we see it all the time 
and teenagers even, you know? Yeah. And so it's like, like there's, they're just, it's so crazy. That was so the recent history and a male like that, who was very much, I think in, in the feminine in a sense, um, was uh-huh. totally ignored and pushed and pushed yeah. and pushed to perform yeah. and make more money. Make and, more money, yeah, yeah. F- to have for everybody else. And all he was the asking handlers. for help all the time. Yeah, he was Every interview, he changed the subject. I mean, you know, people say don't talk about your, your health too much or whatever that uh-huh. stupid thing is. Uh-huh. Um, he would literally, I, I've now read several interviews with him where he would change the topic to the body all the time. People would ask him about record sales and he'd talk about like, he has this like hope in this new antacid or something because it's <laughs> killing him. You know, I mean, <laughs> yeah, I hear him. Awesome. I understand. So, yeah. I get that too. And it's like, nope. You know, of course he turned to drugs. Like, you know, th- that, 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 there was nothing else like at mm-hmm. that time. I mean, I'm sure he had access to good doctors, but no one was looking at mm-hmm. a young guy like that and thinking mm-hmm. this person is chronically ill. Mm hmm. But I feel like, you know, he kind of started, well, he didn't start, but he was like at the forefront of that confession culture where suddenly we could talk about our problems in, you know, public. I mean, it started like the personal is political and the feminists, the second wave. But he, that generation made it okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And, and that, I mean, to me, that was like, that was very positive and very difficult because from in our cultures where yeah. we come from, it's like secrets, the family secrets. Constantly. Keep it all to the family. Do not Never you know, talk about no, your no. problems. <laughs> the Never. problems, your illness. Oh, forget what, it. Yeah, like what the shaming of the family or oh. that, that whole thing that we were raised um, to, to have a certain facade, like, you know, we're royal or something, which we're not. But, you know, that um, appearances above all. Oh, I know. Um, but now we've come like f- full circle, perhaps, where everything is confession, everything is memoir. Um, you know, this generation that who have been raised on social media, you know, it's like sharing everything, oversharing, yeah. over, over, you know, kind of like discussing the most, the detritus, the, the minutia of, <laughs> of their lives. Yeah, totally. So now I, I feel we're in a moment where there is zero discrimination and, and we're kind of afloat. We're almost lost in, you know, TMI. Um, so I think that we, we're ready for some balance again because we've gone too far in this direction right. and, and, as a result, we have lost our capacity to recognize what matters most. I mean, right. out of all the things that we tell each other. Right. You think like, like, I'm so curious. So you think, do you think like we've, like the oversharing has muddled what, what matters? Like it, it's mm-hmm. kind of caused, yes. like it's trivialized exactly. things. Yeah. I can see that. Like, mm-hmm. And I'm an oversharer in a lot of ways. I mean, that's been part of my... I worry about that often. Um, well, we were saying yesterday about rape, the difference between rape versus um, like verbal... Sexual harassment. Sexual harassment. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which is really an important distinction to make. Mm-hmm. Neither are okay. No, but, neither but, is okay. But the yeah. experience of those, every woman I know my age, like we've been through both. Mm-hmm. And while the experience of sexual harassment is horrific it is very different than the experience of rape, which to me is like, oh, yeah. when I think of my rapes, like they're akin to like, like I don't think of them as a sexual act. Mm-mm. I think of them as something close to, closer to homicide. Mm-hmm. That's how I felt when that yeah. was happening, was that yeah. I was going to die. Yeah. Where someone's sexually harassing me uh, while it's uncomfortable and disgusting and, uh, and threatening in a sense, I didn't fear for my life. Right, exactly. You know, yeah, uh, I, I feel the same. That yeah. you know, the rape definitely is a death of sorts. Yeah. <coughs> Sorry, it it is a death of your innocence. It's a death of your understanding of your pl- place in the world. Yeah. Um, it, it, it it ends any assumption you may have that you know you have a right to exist. Yeah. Um. So your body becomes is, foreign yeah. to you. Yeah, your body be- and yeah, and your body becomes the the storage of of trauma. Yeah. So both from a medical you know place, 
but also from a psychic and spiritual place, you know, all of a sudden you're like a garbage bag, you know, you're full of shit, you're full of garbage that hurts you and that you cannot like simply get rid of, you know, you have to do the work, you have to, you know, do a lot of work to clean up, to cleanse, to detoxify, to get all that out of you. And it just accumulates in you so quickly, like how quickly, you know, it lasts so briefly chronologically but it marks you for so long for so long um it's horrifying yeah it's It's horrifying in in so many ways especially because it happens to most of us when we're young so it's even more you know it kind of like scars you even more profoundly yeah um and we were taught it's like the opposite extreme of what you're talking about happening now we were taught to just suck it up oh yeah suck it up i didn't go to yeah. therapy for rape yeah, i didn't neither. report my rape me so neither. i didn't do any of that stuff. i tried to report mine and you know my family was like oh my god you know it, it's gonna be a shame you can't go to the police you know our name will be dragged in the newspapers I we know. have a certain standing in the community what and then the the police department uh you know tried to suppress it so it was and all of that continues to happen you know it's just there is a system in place that does not like um you know the horror of it like look at Brett Kavanaugh it's the same yeah, thing yeah, you know um I didn't tell my parents till years later and they well, were predictably not great about it either they were again like it was like a shameful thing like you know, I, my mother even like said something like about it. well, the the first time she said this, she doesn't say this anymore. But when I was a young, much younger, and I told her, she was like, "Well, remember how you dress." <laughs> and I was like, "How you dress does not what?" Huh? Yeah. Like, I still see these stupid comments on the internet where people say like, "Oh, she's asking for it," blah blah blah. And yeah. again, the, the this like so much like I think of like like. Helen of Troy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, so much goes back to this like phobia and obsession with female sexuality. Uh-huh. When I was a kid, I always wanted to write a screenplay of the Helen of Troy story uh-huh. because I was fascinated by that, right? Uh-huh. With the face that sailed a thousand a ships. A thousand right? ships, yeah. yeah. And it literally, like, Helen's beauty uh-huh. was like responsible. For, uh-huh. like, 20 years of war and another 20 years of trying to get yeah. back home and like, Thousands of women, including hundreds of royal women, being sold to slavery as exactly. loot and whatever. Literally, because yeah. Helen. But he got her back. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy. That that yeah. story. I always have wanted to like write that from the perspective of Helen, because like we don't know really like, like mm-hmm. what Helen have felt like. Mm-hmm. We don't think about Helen's personhood. At well, all. I mean that part of the you know part of that whole uh, narrative is that Helen has no agency at all because it's right. actually the three goddesses who like right. wager amongst themselves right. and then they endow this human who at the time was like a shepherd turned out he was the son of a king but i mean he when they picked on him he was like tending sheep right. and they were like okay we you know we give him the enchantment necessary to go get helen so, you know, the apple, that whole thing, you know, the apple is always, of course, in the, you know, yeah, in the, yeah, <laughs> in the yeah. garden of good and evil. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> totally. um, and, but yeah, what's interesting is that she never had a choice. We are never told whether she wants to marry Manelos or his brother Agamemnon or any of all these suitors that his, right. her father got together or if she really wants to go. Yeah, she doesn't have a choice. It's like the Aphrodite decides and she goes with Paris. And right. then, you know, the gods help the humans fight. And, you know, so again, it, it, there was never an issue of like what she did, but right. you, the, the female body is like the vessel. Right, right. Um, and, you know, the only way that, hum, you know, that human culture within patriarchy has found to, undo that is to cover us up to eliminate mm. us hide us put us keep us in women's quarters you know put us behind the burqa or the right whatever name you have for it but basically yeah, yeah, yeah. hide it right um instead of familiarize it and make right. it normative but it's not i mean it's so funny that i just thought the other day someone was talking about going on um like live television i, th- I thought a few times i've been interviewed for like tv or video things and they'll still say things like 
don't wear tank tops or short sleeves shirts. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, they, like, they say that, <laughs> and it's like it reminds <laughs> me, and I think of like, yeah. is this the Islamic Republic of Iran? Like, really, <laughs> what is so scary about yeah. my arms? Mm-hmm. Like, that's gonna make people think of sex and sexuality. Like that, yeah, the shoulders, like it's I crazy. Know. And so I see a lot of younger women just like opting to like hide their bodies mm-hmm. you know and mm-hmm. that's to them maybe a form of empowerment i don't know i don't know what that they would do if they didn't live in a world that was this sexist and this like you know criminal with its sexism yeah um would they feel that need i mean i, I see them coming up with creative right. solutions and making it like yeah. fashion but i think that you know covering up the body is just going along with this exotization of the feminine you know, which is part of our undoing, part of our marginalization is that we're always the other, the right. exotic, you know, right. other, right? That's the object of desire right. instead of like the subject. Well, again, was that a survival thing in the 90s, androgyny? Because andro- androgyny in the 90s was very different mm-hmm. than like non-binary mm-hmm. culture. Yeah, 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 yeah. It, it was very different. It didn't have that same... That's how we got our power, the little power we right. had. The it little almost, equilibrium of power was by becoming androgynous. Yeah, like my head was almost shaved. It was so short. Mm-hmm. And I would go to clubs where people didn't really know my gender and I dressed like, you know. And and I don't know, I can't remember why that was, you know, I shopped from the little boy section. And <laughs> like, the, 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 you know, I, when I'd go to clubs, yeah. I'd buy yeah. like a... Yeah, Elmo T-shirt or something from yeah. the boys section or something. I don't know, and I I don't know what I I don't know what that was about. But whereas like I look at it, those photos with some affection, I also am a little bit disturbed by it because that choice to like opt for androgyny is it is it was it protective, um, or was it like empowering? I I don't understand because again, like that narrative was interrupted by the 2000s. So we weren't able to work it out. No, we we never worked it out. Yeah. And what would have happened if that had been an interruption? I don't know. I think we were trying to steal or, you know, like borrow a little of the power of the man. Yeah, maybe. But yeah, it ended. I mean, I got knocked up. (laughs) I got pregnant right then in, wow. uh, you know, in the nineties at the end. And so, uh, I get my, my, I think my daughter was like two when nine eleven happened. So all, of, I mean, I didn't even remember I could get pregnant when I got pregnant and none of my friends had kids. I wasn't conscious of children. I didn't, I lived in a very adult world, you know, in yeah, New York yeah, yeah. City. So, um, I went to the midwife like with my purse. I didn't have outfits for the baby or a hat or a car seat or a, you know I just thought I'll give birth and I'll go home and live my life you know like I have a dog I'm a good dog mom I can do the <gasps> kid mom thing That's amazing. <laughs> I didn't have any concept of of it wow. um like a man again you know being yeah. so deeply in like this man's world that um but it definitely uh, you know having a daughter there <laughs> taught me a lot, but in the process, so much changed. And then I woke up when she started going to school, you know, Montessori, and she was like three. And like everyone around was getting boobs and, uh, you know, implants. And yeah, yeah, yeah. that's when I realized the culture has shifted again. Right. And, we, you know, everybody wants to be like a Barbie. When did this happen? It is so crazy. I think about like, I mean, like sex in the city and. All Sex those in the shows city, yeah. and like the obsession with Brazilian bikini waxes and like um hair Manolo Blahniks. And, <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah. and these horrible drinks like apple martinis. Yeah, and, and, like Jimmy and Jimmy Chu. Jimmy Chu. It's like it's, overnight it happened. It was crazy. I mean it, that that show feels more dated to me than like shows from like the eighties in a way because it's yeah. like this It went like, like Farah Fawcett forgotten. We all dressed in like deconstructed, yeah. you know, boy clothes, yeah. right? Um uh, you know, more British really influenced than anything. Like Vivian yeah. Westwood, whatever. And then you wake up and it's Sex and the City, exactly. Yeah, which had nothing that to world. do with New York. Nothing. I didn't even know weird... where these women were. I hadn't seen them before. I'd never, 
ever did. It was the sanitized, yeah. weird New yeah. York yeah. that was like almost like, I mean, I guess I could appreciate it on a level of camp, but even that doesn't work for me because they all were sort of like these wealthy women yeah. that, that they were just women who would s- like marry Wall Street guys or, or date Wall Street guys and summer in the Hamptons or something like that. Yeah. But they were not anywhere where where we were in the village. They they, no. they said they lived where we lived. Yeah, but, but I didn't, see, I them didn't see them either. Oh my God, I love that we're talking about this because <laughs> I just like, I always feel so alienated. And where did they people. shop? I mean, I didn't even see those clothes at Barney's. No, exactly. Where were they? Vendels? I don't think <laughs> I don't so. Know. Bloomies. Bloomies. Oh my probably. God. Yeah, that's where yeah. It had to be that. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah, because it's like I literally never yeah. saw people. They weren't cool. Like no. the thing about New York, they were not I, in Soho. I yeah. mean, they are now, but they were not then. No, they were never. I mean, the, the, the part of the charm of New York is that New York is perpetually cool. Yeah, you know, and and, yeah. and it's and it has a true iconoclasm. Mm-hmm. So to have these sort of like female icons that are supposed to be Oh, yeah, be they New were Yorkers. representing us, yeah. I mean, the writer so is the protagonist, you know. Yeah, but again, like, lawyer? what writer did you know that lived like that? Like, activist lawyer? No, no, but are you kidding me? Who can afford that wardrobe and the closets? Uh, what? It's so bizarre. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I know, and yet, you know. I, I mean, mean, I had a lot of clothes in New York. You know, I bought my first Prada dress when I was in my 20s with like my first money that I put aside yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah you know we all were like a little fashion victim but I didn't do ga- you know I like I remember actually I bought like you know wedding gowns and wore them at you know clubs and yeah, yeah, yeah. for fun but but that, but they were not doing it in cheek there no. like there was no quotes <laughs> there was no no exactly oh my god um yeah we always had like I don't know how we always afforded those clothes. There was always a way. I once made out with a guy at a shop on (laughs) on East Eighth Street. No, it was um, it was it was East Seventh Street. It was a it was a vintage clothing store, and I literally made out with him for fifty percent off the stress. (laughs) I still wish I had. It was so great. It was like weird things like that happen to you or like mm-hmm. I get stopped on the street by some like designer who's like hey can you come by my studio I want you to try on this thing and mm-hmm. you're like okay and there's just this like other feel mm-hmm. in that city and every time I go back and I, I I want that again like I want that community sense and that weirdness and that you know yeah um, everybody's uh, very close to everybody else yeah you know that, uh, the college campus definitely yeah feeling. it is it is like a really cool yeah. campus life yeah yeah especially since we're our spaces are so small still <laughs> well maybe that was how they captured middle yeah. america why, yeah. by creating a college campus that was really right. um full of normals yeah and that yeah. was the only way that could make it on mainstream tv mm-hmm. because i mean was it friends in new york too yeah friends was in new york what too. the hell and like, Seinfeld. Yeah, and Seinfeld, so, I could kind of okay, see. Okay, yeah, that's like, more of um, boys. People, yeah, I saw those right? boys, yeah. But, uh, but I really didn't see... Friends, like, too. I could I've, I could see friends more... May, maybe not Jennifer Aniston, but yeah. everybody else, yeah. Or, or I not... I mean, Monica, I could see. Monica, but yeah. Phoebe was like L.A. Phoebe was L.A., but whatever, a transplant. I mean, I... The Friends, it was more was, normal for me than Sex in the City. Sex right. in the City was just so over the top... Um, I only understood it when I moved, not not when I moved to Miami, but when, as I said, I became a, a mom and met other moms oh, right. who had like husband money oh. <laughs> and shopped in Bal Harbor. And then I saw it, oh, God. you know, but until then, even when I was in Miami, it was so Latin and sexy and, you know, fast and heated and people were not like dre- dressed like that. But then I entered like the private school world of parents and yeah oh I met God. them <laughs> I oh met them all man. and it's you know um I, I just felt progressively year by year that we were you know retrenched in re- going mm. backward and going backward and you know then my daughter became a high schooler and it was you know, 
the story of like the boys getting the blowjobs on the school bus again and oh. the girls and no one was talking feminism and it's like wait we had gone so much further than this yeah. and here we are you know like starting over and I have to explain to them about oral sex because they don't know that boys go down on girls right the, ha, 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 what and I have to tell them like do not give it unless you get it first and oh no one else told them that and this is the 21st century you had to teach your daughter that. Yeah, I had to teach her and her friends. Oh my God. No one said it. You were that mom who was like the yeah. cool mom. Like, <laughs> mom. I always wish that mom could have taught me things. Yeah. I would hear rumors those moms existed, <laughs> but I, I never knew where they were. But that's yeah. like, that's I some know. God's work you did right there. I did, I know. It's like, I know. God, I mean, sex education i was just listening the other day to that do you remember that nana cherry song with it michael stipe oh yeah yeah yeah, yeah 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 trout and it's yeah sex ed. yeah yeah and sex ed was such a big thing in like the 80s and 90s but like they did such a poor job of it oh my god it was, it was so such a poor done. job like, it's like you just wanted to fall asleep oh my god they didn't talk i mean they maybe put a condom on a banana <laughs> and then they would tell you like talk about dental dams or dental things you dams, just literally yeah. like never saw in real life and never like, <laughs> um, and then it was a lot of like AIDS talk I was constantly getting AIDS tests like obsessively like yeah. so scared um, and then just but there was no talk of pleasure uh, certainly not female pleasure certainly uh, nothing about female orgasms like oh, how yeah. many different kinds there are or where how nothing. to get the G-spot going nothing. or no no no, mm -hmm. I wouldn't. I, I had no idea what was going on, like for so yeah. long. The big I, revelation was like the clitoris, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> which, you know, when you actually like look into it a little bit and study about it, it's just, you know, 101. There is so much more, so many more erogenous zones and, you know, orgasmic triggers wow but we like didn't I still don't know <laughs> <laughs> i'm like huh yeah no it's it's crazy like yeah there's no talk of that there was because again you had to control women you couldn't let the girls become sluts yeah you know? exactly like, yeah. you couldn't let them run wild you had to protect them from the boys and you had to mm -hmm. keep the women pure or else you know they're mm -hmm. they're bodies are vessels for procreation so mm -hmm. that's what they need to be primed for it's so primitive i mean god i just if the climate change wasn't so depressing i, like, <laughs> I wish we could be zoomed into the future like a thousand years but mm -hmm. i don't know like i don't know how we survived it we did it though we i don't know how we have survived all this lack of reason <laughs> I know, just all this insanity but i think like you know our first task is to separate morality from sexuality yeah that's period true. right so and you know then like i mean this, this podcast that's exactly that. You know, I'm, I'm trying to give a language for sex because there isn't one. You know, yeah, it's the yeah. one thing that's like unspeakable and unarticulated. Yeah. And, you know, what you were just saying about sex ed continues all the way during the sex. Right. Yeah, and yeah, then, yeah. you know, we don't negotiate what we're going to do sexually because we're supposed to be like overtaken by so much unspeakable, uh, you know, uncontrollable passion. And then during the sex, we're not supposed to talk about what we're doing or what we want or how to make it better again, because we're supposed to be like beyond, you know, speech yeah. and consciousness. And I feel that this is an opportunity for us women to just like take charge and say, okay, you know, we're going to make up the language of sex and we're going to speak it. And since we're in charge of consent, yeah. we're going to say how it's going to be done and it'll be better for everyone, for guys too, which kind of like absolves them from this responsibility of having to guess every female body they run into. <laughs> and like know what to do by virtue of having the penis, which like they know nothing about how we work. Exactly. It's completely unknown territory. That's totally true. I know. So I think it will be better for them too, but I'm really, you know, care much more about um, finding a way to give women a new voice and a new confidence, which then we can, you know, take into all the other aspects of our lives maybe. Yeah, totally. I think yeah. that's a that's a beautiful thought and I think we can get there yeah we can get there we can get there together yeah if we like keep going and don't shut up <laughs> yeah exactly I'm so stimulated by like yeah. the thoughts of others and, and 
getting together and creating mm-hmm. something bigger than both of our brains. Mm-hmm. Like, um, so I'm hoping that I can work on more creative collaborations. Um, yeah. Cause I, I just, that's, that's just, I don't know, at the age, you know, I hit my 40s and I became far more interested in that. Yeah, that's beautiful. I agree with you. Yeah. 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 Just everybody, you know, together is smarter, stronger, yeah. you know, had, had like more than just self-motivated because you feel like you're doing something for the greater good. Exactly. Yeah. When we can hold each other up. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, we that's won't beautiful. let each other fall. I, yeah. don't, I don't think we will. We won't. We're here to stay. Yeah, that's the thing. They cannot get rid of us. Mm -mm, We endure. Yeah, we do. We endure, yeah. We're built better that way. Exactly, exactly. (laughs) We're built to withstand a hell of a lot of pain. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah, those labor pains. Every day I think of that. Like, you know, and I think of like, I deal with all sorts of pain, but then I think of like the pains of even motherhood, Mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. and all of the... The creators, generation after yeah. generation, yeah. are the reason why we exist. And it's like mm-hmm. men could never, mm-hmm. men could never. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for coming. Thank you so much um, for having me. Yeah, it was a beautiful conversation. Thank, I really enjoyed yeah. it. Thank Come you. Come back. I would love to. I love talking to you. And yeah. it's uh, thank me you too. for doing this this mm. podcast. I think it's really really important. Yeah. Thank you. I have no choice. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody out there, thank you for listening. This again was Poroshista Kapoor here on a short visit, teaching in Miami. Thank you for trusting me as your sex whisperer. And until I, I <laughs> until I'm back next Friday, speak sex. <laughs>